In this session, what we are going to discuss is about uh, data quality practices in Sri Lanka. So what I hope to do in this session is that uh, I will be taking two examples, two implementations in Sri Lanka. One is from the RMNCH program and the other one is from the nutrition program. And I'm going to discuss how these elements of uh, uh, ensuring data quality has been applied in these uh, two implementations. So the first uh, scenario or the first use case that I'm going to talk about is the RMNCH uh, program in Sri Lanka. So this in fact was one of the major DHS2 implementations in Sri Lanka. And it took us a lot of efforts to get this implemented. The main reason being uh, the, the paper-based data collection system uh, of RMNCH has been a, a well-established system for uh, more than three decades. So trying to introduce a digital system and also trying to ensure at least the minimum data quality that was already there in the paper-based system was a major challenge. So let us see how we uh, applied these concepts of uh, data quality uh, while we were planning the implementation. So we might feel that uh, uh, ensuring data quality is, is, is a very complicated task, but I will show you how simple you can start. So for example, the first thing that we did was uh, we concentrated about data quality while we were designing the data entry forms. So one simple step that we ensured was that because we were trying to introduce this uh, digital system to an already existing paper-based system, we tried to adhere to the well-established data flows. In simple words, what we tried to do is uh, the data in entry interfaces or the data forms in the DHIS2, the data sets, we tried to uh, uh, make the user interfaces as much as similar to the existing paper-based formats. I mean, we always say that you have to optimize the data collection forms, but while ensuring that, we tried to keep the flow of the data, the, in, the order in which appear, the same as how it is in data uh, entry forms. So by doing that, uh, we can minimize the random errors that, that, that uh, data entry people might do because they just have to follow the same uh, workflow that they are doing while entering data into paper formats. So uh, for this instance, what we created was a custom data entry form, not a section or standard DHS2 data set, but it was a custom form. So let me show you, first of all, now this is the paper format that we had in the RMNCH, uh, the main aggregate data collection form. You can see it's a very complicated forms. There are so many data uh, items or data elements. And of course, most of these uh, columns that you see here are uh, the periods. So the columns, of course, uh, do not come into this our data entry interface, but what I'm talking here is about uh, having the same order uh, as how it is appearing in the, uh, the paper format. And we uh, had the same workflow while we did the transition to the digital format. So here, what you're seeing is our DHIS2 custom data set or data entry form. And uh, please excuse me for the language, the forms are in local language, but uh, what I want to highlight is the same order that we have it in the paper format, we have been following in DHS2 data set as well. Even though we have done some slight modifications, for example, we have set up here uh, the vertical tabs uh, uh, to capture this large amount of data, but the, 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 the flow of uh, information capture remains the same. And the next thing is sometimes uh, when we are designing forms, we cannot actually replicate the paper forms into the DHIS2. There are some optimizations that we have to do, uh, especially like there are things like uh, duplicate data collection. And there are so many things uh, that, that we don't do in an optimum way in paper-based uh, collection, but which we can optimize when we are uh, creating the data sets in the DHIS2. So for example, uh, in the mental health system, this is the paper form that we are using. But when we were trying to uh, convert that into DHIS2, what we actually did was we optimized the data form. And at the same time, we had the opportunity of modifying the existing paper-based paper data collection form so that it kind of added uh, to the quality of data that is collected. So that uh, now, for example, now this is the modified paper-based uh, form that we were able to create. Uh, because like uh, when we went one step ahead, this is the DHIS2 based uh, uh, data collection form. So to minimally confuse the users and uh, at, at the point of generation of data, we tried to use the same uh, data collection form as that, that we have in the DHIS2. So what we did was we kind of modified the existing uh, paper-based form uh, to be optimized paper form. 
This is another example of the same uh, mental health system where we have uh, optimized the data collection forms. Right. And sometimes, uh, of course, uh, in, the, in, this, in this ERHMI system, there were requirements such as like uh, when we wanted to collect these WHO MNH indicators, we did not have a, uh, a paper-based form to start with. So there, of course, we had the luxury of uh, designing our paper-based form also from the scratch, which, uh, which was kind of easy because uh, this is the DHIS2 uh, data set, or rather uh, the, the event form. And that one, uh, based on that one, so for when designing that one, we were able to uh, follow the best practices. And then we came back and we designed a new paper form uh, for the collection of data. Because most of the uh, uh, I mean, like, yeah, institutes that are involved with our MCH system, uh, they do not capture the data to the electronic system at the point of generation. So usually the data entry happens uh, on a paper-based form, and then that is copied into the uh, DHIS2. Right. And uh, I mean, further expanding on this, one, one thing that we had to make sure, uh, uh, like uh, when we are having this di digital transformation from paper system to the electronic system, is to minimally interrupt the uh, workflow. Because the thing is, I think that's, that should be the context of most of the countries, because if you, have a, you may have a well-established paper, paper format. And when you are trying to introduce a digital system, we should try to minimally disrupt the existing data flow. Just like uh, the, the government's uh, uh, motive is, uh, the, is, to, is to provide better health, not only data. So if you are just trying to you know, um, uh, enhance the uh, data, I mean, uh, the, the quality of data by introducing uh, the digital system, and at the same time, if you are kind of disrupting an existing data flow, that will have a lot of resistance uh, during the implementation from so many stakeholders. Uh, so uh, the other thing that we try to do with this is that in our paper-based system uh, in Sri Lanka, we had these different approval levels. So those were uh, inherent data quality measures that were there at field levels. So when we were introducing DHIS2, what we did was we did not try to capture data to the digital system just at the same time. So we, we preserved the paper-based system and we kind of uh, ask them to copy the paper, uh, the data that is captured in the paper-based system into the digital system. And also the approval workflows that were already there, we tried to uh, implement in DHIS2 so that there was one step verification before the data goes uh, higher up along the hierarchy, uh, the health hierarchy. So that uh, the, the data approval workflows were was a major uh, contributing uh, factor for data, uh, assuring data quality in this ERHMIS or the uh, digital MCH system. We conducted uh, the training programs. In fact, like uh, well, what you're seeing here is uh, one of our field, field level training program. And the person who is in, uh, in the front is the one who is leading this entire uh, um, MCH system, uh, Dr. Kaushalya. I think she's a participant in this uh, academy also. We are so much grateful to her and her team uh, for implementing all this, uh, uh, the data quality practices in her system. So here, uh, the data quality measures and how they should capture data and at that point, how to ensure data quality was an inherent component uh, during these training programs that we conducted at field level. So what we did was we had a national team uh, uh, who were kind of master trainers and we were able to replicate the training programs using our uh, tra trainers who are at uh, field level. So all these training programs had a, uh, had a special emphasis on ensuring data. Uh, data quality, like uh, for example, uh, especially at the point of generation, uh, point of capture of data, there were so many data quality measures, which I will be showing you in the uh, next few slides. So there was special emphasis that we uh, put on data quality during this induced training program. And um, uh, one other thing about uh, uh, ensuring data quality is to have proper user manuals or SOPs. Uh, the thing is, like the DHIS2 has its own um, extensive uh, user guide, which, like, I'm sure that uh, that may confuse many end users. If you just ask these uh, end users to refer the DHIS2 user manual, which is available online, so that of course didn't work, and we realized that. So what we did was we created uh, the end user manual, uh, which is of course uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a very comprehensive end user manual with the uh, screenshots uh, and also like explaining everything in very simple. Uh, simple manner, uh, which could be comprehended by end users. So this end user manual was something that we handed over to the end users during our training programs, uh, uh, which they can keep uh, at their workplaces and they can refer. 
Uh, but the thing is, like, this is a kind of a comprehensive user manual, uh, which may be a bit too uh, bit too much when you are just uh, trying to find something real quick uh, when you are entering data uh, at your desk. So for that purpose, uh, we had another type of manual, which I will show in a while. And the other thing is, uh, there were so many SOPs that we created uh, before we tried to implement the system. Because like we understood uh, initially that uh, when you are having this digital transformation from paper-based system, which was kind of well established into the digital system, there may be a lot of uh, resistance that, that we might en uh, encounter because for the simple reason that users don't like uh, too much of change. So we try to simpli simplify everything so that uh, uh, to make sure that the end users don't uh, see this learning curve as a very difficult one. So this is where we had different levels of uh, SOPs. So this one you are that, that, that you are seeing is a checklist that all the facilities should have before entering data into the system. So here we try to uh, explain everything in a simple way. And this we have asked them to keep uh, by the side of uh, the computer that they're using uh, for data entry. But the one that we have asked them either to keep at all times next to their computers or else to uh, paste it on the wall uh, where they are entering data is this one. So these are uh, simple single page end user manuals or SOPs that we have created just uh, uh, specifically to given tasks. So these kind of, uh, I mean, like how this, uh, this helps in data quality is that the thing is like, if you perceive uh, using a system as a kind of a difficult one, then there is high chance that, I mean, that's this, this is what we have seen, that there is a high chance that they might make mistakes. So having these specific uh, SOPs and uh, uh, the user manuals uh, with the end users kind of uh, really contributed uh, to ensuring uh, the perceived ease of use of this system, which of course contributed to the uh, data quality um, in the end. So these kind of manuals uh, or SOPs we had for each of these tasks. And this is exactly what we followed uh, in our COVID implementation, which was kind of a rapid implementation from the learnings uh, that we had from our uh, MCH system. And this is another single page uh, user mm -hmm. document that uh, the MCH system is using. And then uh, we also tried to use uh, remote uh, uh, administration software, so remote desktop softwares like TeamViewer, because like how it really contributed us in ensuring data quality is that mm -hmm. what we saw was that uh, when we are trying to provide support, support to end users, there were some issues where they cannot actually explain even over the phone. So if, if they actually cannot uh, uh, solve their problem, they try to enter data uh, which might be erroneous, right? Uh, because like if they they, they, they would assume that uh, this would be the proper way of using and which is not ex ex uh, exactly the correct way. So here we are using TeamViewer as a, as a tool where we can connect from national level to the uh, end user's computer and assist them in troubleshooting. So with this, uh, we were able to, uh, in fact, observe the data quality, I mean, like how they are entering data, what are the mistakes that they are doing, um, as well as it uh, helped us in troubleshooting uh, when they are having issues. So for this one also, we had uh, separate uh, SOPs that we uh, created. And the other thing that really helped us in ensuring um, uh, that data entry is timely um, and like uh, data entry users are having minimal issues uh, is that the user support. So for the, uh, to provide the user support, we had this three tier model. So here what happens is we had this, uh, the, the initial communication method, which should happen using fax or, uh, or uh, the hotline, or else we are using this instant messaging platform such as Viber. So there, of course, they can uh, reach our initial help desk for, uh, so for simple troubleshooting, let it be uh, public health uh, related issues or else uh, very technological issues. Like this will be uh, attended at tier one. And then in case they cannot uh, settle it there, they'll be directed to the tier two where we have a medical officer who, uh, in public health as well as our ICT officer will be attending to these issues. And if they can't also solve them, we have uh, the consultant community physicians who are attending these technical matters related to public health issues and the medical officer in health informatics Will be uh, who, who is going to attend to the very technical or technological issues. So this way, it, it really uh, helped us in ensuring that all the issues the end users are having are attended. 
And when it comes to specific data quality measures that are already there in DHIS2, uh, we, are, we are mainly using in uh, most of these MCH data sets, uh, uh, the validation rules and compulsory data elements. Uh, in addition, we are also using the data pool. But we are in the process of in the, uh, incorporating min-max predictors, WHO data quality tools, scorecards, and legends in these uh, MCH instances. But like, uh, uh, why, why there is a delay is that we are trying to match all these uh, tools that are there into the existing uh, 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 the workflows. So that is why it is taking uh, some, some time. But this is our plan in next, over the uh, next uh, one year's time to incorporate all this into the uh, MCH data flow. And when it comes to review and feedback, we, we, uh, we identify review and feedback as a major measure in ensuring data quality. So what we do is we have uh, created dashboards which uh, and, and provided our end users instructions on how they should be following and adhering this dashboard. So they are supposed to uh, use these monitoring dashboards at health facility level, district level, provincial level, and at national level. So there have been clear instructions that we have provided to the end users on how to use these dashboards. And in addition, we have the national uh, level staff who will be drilling down and, uh, and, and conducting desk reviews from uh, time to time to make sure that whether there are any data quality or uh, a, uh, any major data quality issues uh, which are happening at uh, field level. Because like this is kind of like a secondary level of monitoring for all the district level staff which we are doing at national level. And uh, to complement this, we have regular reviews which is happening at uh, the PHM is the field level, public health midwife level, or medical officer of health is the, is kind of like sub-district level, RDHS is the district level, and at the country level in these frequencies that we have mentioned. So how this happened is that, now this, what you are seeing here is a kind of like a district level review, where all the, uh, uh, the, the medical doctors who are in charge of all these sub-districts will come to this place, along with few uh, public health, uh, level staff uh, and we are doing a comprehensive review so these are uh, and, and and one key thing is this, is that uh, for all these reviews we are using the dhs2 based mch system so we will be displaying the dashboards and they have to comment on uh, any of the data quality issues that uh, that that the expert panel from national level are asking now these reviews uh, did not stop even during the covid pandemic what actually happened was like it was another opportunity for us to uh, further explore what are the uh, avenues which are available to uh, conduct these online. So what we do did was we we uh, organized uh, the Zoom platform that we have, and uh, through the Zoom we were able to conduct this um, uh, monthly and uh, quarterly review at district level uh, using this uh, I mean the remote technology. So none of these review activities have stopped even during the COVID nineteen pandemic. So what you are seeing here is the district level staff. Uh, who are joining uh, through Zoom and the national level staff uh, who are kind of monitoring whatever they are presenting. Right, and these data that we, that we have uh, gathered through our MCH system is produced as an annual report uh, mm -hmm. from the Ministry of Health. And we also have a MCH quarterly report. For all these reports, the data is coming through uh, the DHS2 based system. And this is why like once these reports are public, uh, uh, are, are made public, uh, the, the Institute and the Ministry has to hold the responsibility. So uh, that is why we are trying to ensure data quality in our dhs 2 based system, because the reports are actually uh, generated through this system only. Right. So these are some data quality measures that we have ensured uh, in our uh, MCH system. So with this, I'm going to move on to our second example, which is uh, the nutrition monitoring system. So uh, this, of course, was uh, uh, was a requirement which is coming from the presidential secretariat level of, uh, of Sri Lanka, where the requirement was to identify children who are having uh, nutrition-related problems at field level and to obtain multi-sector support to address them at field level. But then the information had to be collected and verified and transmitted all the way up to the national level and shared with the uh, multi-sector stakeholders. So uh, the major functionality of this system uh, was to register the children with malnutrition at field level. And then they wanted to routinely monitor and track the nutritional parameters such as uh, height and weight and household risk factors. So these are the uh, routinely monitored uh, uh, components. And then um, 
obtain household geolocations and also perform analytics and uh, uh, charts for the mobile users and to synchronize the data which is collected at field level uh, with the central server and uh, then share with the stakeholders. So to, uh, to achieve all these requirements, we felt that it was the mobile technology that we have to use and uh, uh, the, the, the traditional use of uh, laptops and computers to enter data will not really work because the data had to be captured at individual level at field level. So uh, this requirement, of course, came uh, around five, uh, four to five years back. So at that time, the DHS2 Android native mobile application was not that mature because nowadays it is having so many uh, useful features. But th those days, uh, there were some restrictions uh, to fulfill these functionalities that were, uh, that were required by the program. So uh, what happened was this public health midwife, who's a field level health staff, uh, health worker, will collect data at field level, which is then synchronized into the DHS2 based central server, and which could be accessed by their supervising officers and all the staff at district and national level uh, using the web interface. And once this data is uh, sent by the midwife, uh, their immediate supervising officer, who is the uh, medical officer of health or the public health nursing sister should validate that data and the data had to be returned back. I mean, this validation, once it happens only, the data could be shared with all the, uh, the stakeholders who are involved in the process. So to do this, uh, of course, uh, what we did was to have this uh, design, this custom uh, Android application uh, due to the obvious reason that uh, some of these requirements were not uh, be able to meet by the uh, DHS to Android application at that time. Right, so let's uh, quickly look at few data quality measures that uh, uh, that were there in place in this Android mobile application while capturing data. So the first thing is like uh, there were some uh, there were few simple interfaces, and um, now as you can see here, uh, these are the these are few interfaces that we used, and and the sim uh, and simplifying interfaces itself uh, was identified as one major factor. Uh, to enhance the compliance of the end users who are using the system, these field health staff, and also to uh, enhance the data quality. Because like uh, what we found out from our study was that when you, uh, when you have very complicated workflows and very crowded interfaces, uh, <clears throat> it, it, it contributed adversely to the data quality because uh, the end users can make a lot of mistakes uh, because they just become confused uh, due to the complexity of the interfaces. So sim using simple interfaces was one major practice that we followed. And secondly, uh, uh, because they were collecting this uh, height and weight values of the children with malnutrition, what we did was we provided them a visual verification of the, uh, the data as they entered. It. So if you can focus in, uh, on this height and weight values that are entered here, you can see that color of this one is uh, greenish. So that, uh, and, and he, this one is kind of like a yellowish amber color. So what happens is uh, now when someone start typing height, what will happen is like uh, the, there will be some age verification based on the, uh, so we have the date of birth of the child and the today date. And uh, with this, we'll be able to know which, which is the age. And there'll be a, a kind of a verification with the comparison of this WHO. Uh, there are standard ranges, the reference ranges for different standard deviation values. Uh, for height and weight for that uh, particular age. So if the, uh, the height or weight value is okay, it will be a, a kind of a greenish color. If it is uh, slightly bad, it will be amber. And if it is really bad, it will be uh, red color. So that way, there will be a visual verification that happens at the point of data entry uh, so that it will give an idea about uh, if there is a major mistake done by the end user at that point itself. And then, of course, uh, to further uh, uh, assist with data quality as well as to support the interventions. What we did was uh, we provided some uh, longitudinal charting. So these are kind of like analyst analytic outputs that we integrated into the system, which contributes to enhancing data quality. So here, what happened is like uh, in, the, in the mobile app itself, the end user after entering uh, the height and weight values can verify uh, by uh, uh, observing this height and weight charts and see whether there is a, uh, I mean, kind of a significant uh, abnormality in uh, any of these values that have been entered. Right. So there'll be a kind of a, this is kind of like a dual verification of the data that was entered by the end user. And in addition, uh, there were simple reports and simple analytics which were available 
to the end user in the mobile application itself. So it, it kind of provided them a, a very brief uh, uh, overview about, uh, say, like here, what you can see is like how many children of uh, each of these nutrition problem were there uh, under her care. So that kind of uh, uh, analytic outputs were available uh, for the end user. So once this data was captured at the field level, then next uh, there were some uh, some validations that happened at uh, facility level. So for this one also, there was a custom web app uh, which was designed uh, mainly to cater the requirement of data approval of tracker data, because this is tracker data, right? So this, uh, even though it's collected by a custom Android application, the data is sent to the DHIS2 system. So that means all this has to be in compliance with the DHIS2 data model. So, this tracker data that is entered here uh, will be verified by their supervising officer. So the supervising public health nursing system has to go through this data and uh, they mm -hmm. will be the ones who will be marking them as completed after ensuring that uh, they are adhering to the, I mean, at least like these, these are plausible values. That's what they can uh, maximum, I mean, at ma maximum level they can do. So once this is done, there will be a data approval which happens at the medical officer of health, the MOH level. And once the data approved only, the data will be visualized and shared with other stakeholders at uh, uh, provincial and national level. And in addition, um, there were several data quality measures that happened at uh, various other levels, uh, which uh, kind of assisted in this entire process. Because like the data had to be shared with the multi-sector stakeholders. Uh, this was a crucial step uh, for validation of data that is captured at uh, the field level. Right, so I think I have consumed almost 25 minutes, so slightly over. So mm -hmm. I will stop it at there. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm willing to take them. Thank you so much. Great, no, thank you so much, Pamud. That was an outstanding presentation. I really appreciate how you touched on so many various elements of data quality that people don't always think about. We're always so, you're, you're exactly right, we're always so concerned about checking the data once it gets into the system and the different tools that we have in DHS too. But you're, you hit the nail on the head, so to speak, when you talked about like form design, standard operating procedures, training processes, you know, all of these things are absolutely critical to data quality. And I, I'm really, we tried to make that point yesterday and I'm really glad you, you were able to drive it home today. Um, we did have one question from the community. And again, everyone, we are taking your questions on the Slack channel, just like we did yesterday. So please, if you have a question, post that to the Slack channel. There was one question. Um, they are asking if you faced any challenges or you had to change anything during the implementation of these various reporting forms and data quality checks. So once you started actually implementing, how did you, were there any changes that you had to make in the process? Uh, well, okay. Uh, so as I mentioned, one crucial fact was that we had to minimally disrupt the existing workflow. So one major thing, I mean, like this was not a very kind of a abrupt implementation. So there was, uh, I mean, especially my other colleague from Sri Lanka, Dr. Priyanka was the one who was uh, greatly involved with this MCH system. So there was like at least more than one year of planning in, uh, in assessing all the workflows and paper forms to ensure that uh, I was, and, and there was, uh, I mean, the other thing that I did not mention here, is the testing and piloting that goes into uh, the entire process before you actually uh, implement the system. Because like uh, most of these data quality measures should be captured at that point if the system is not capturing data. I mean, like there are errors in uh, data quality that you observe during this piloting process. Those have, I mean, you have to come back and uh, uh, reverse uh, whatever the workflows or the data sets designs that you are following. So there was a lot of planning and that's how, uh, uh, I mean, after doing that only, uh, we went for the first round of implementation. So there were a lot of uh, issues that we found at that phase that were corrected. And then what happened was uh, during the initial round of change uh, training that we did all around the country, there were some feedback that were coming related mm -hmm. to different issues in, with the uh, data sets and accessing the system, workflows, things like that. So during that time, we accommodated a lot of uh, changes that came from the uh, from the end users. But after the first round of implementations, we kind of like what we did was we received feedback from the end users, but we did not uh, go on changing the uh, uh, the formats, uh, the data entry formats uh, from time to time. But what we informed them was that if you need us to accommodate something in this uh, the designs of the forms, so this will only be done. Uh, maybe at the start of next year. So 
So we kind of like, if they are not really critical, we kind of collected all of all, all these things and we discuss internally within our team. And uh, uh, maybe at the start of next year only, we will accommodate them into the DHS2 based forms. But if there were major changes that required uh, maybe collect, I mean, like to decide whether this data item had to be collected and all, that of course had to go to the public health specialist and there has to be a decision that is that is required, which is of course totally out of the scope of the DHS2 implementation. So yes, there were challenges, but uh, we were careful not to uh, entertain and include all the uh, uh, changes made by the end users, but we reviewed and uh, incorporated them on time uh, on time to time basis. Thank you. Great. I think that's quite clear. Thank you for that answer. Um, a couple of more questions. I know you're a busy man, but if we can just keep you around for a few more minutes. Um, question from Lisa Grout. Um, in the application that where you're you're tracking individual children, do you do the validation child by child? Yeah, <laughs> good question. Yes, the thing is this, uh, it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing. I mean, like this is one reason like why we try to incorporate all these, uh, the, the, the color verification and things like that at the point of data capture, because otherwise it's going to be a very hectic task for the supervising officer uh, to go through all the reports. So what we have, uh, I mean, like we have made provisions in the system uh, to verify uh, child by child. But when we are implementing, what we have asked them is like, because the thing is, these are kind of like, when you try to have these uh, systems implemented in a couple of uh, districts or provinces, the infrastructure uh, could be even technology, uh, mobile, I mean, like uh, the network, as well as human resources, they tend to uh, greatly vary from uh, district to district or even from health facility to health facility. So what we have instructed them with, like uh, you always need to uh, like, this is, I mean, the system has the potential, but like it really depends on the capacity that you have in your health facility. Like if uh, ensure, I mean, like ensuring data quality. So there is always a kind of a, uh, uh, a fine balance between data quality and uh, actually capturing data. Because like uh, if you have minimal capacity and you try it and your and your priority number one is uh, uh, ensuring data quality, then no, no data will come out from that facility. So. Uh, it's kind of like we have given them the choice. So uh, this is what the system has. This is the best practice, but it's totally up to you to decide uh, uh, on what you should do. But we have uh, given them some hints as to like how to capture uh, uh, if there are any major data quality issues. Like, like I mean, we have asked them to uh, observe the data entry practices, practices of the end users. And if they uh, identify from the preliminary study that there are a couple of end users who, who really do these mistakes over and over again, then you can either focus on them when you are validating the data or as to uh, provide them kind of refresher training and guidance uh, to ensure that they are not uh, doing those mistakes. So uh, there are, I mean, like the simple answer is like, uh, we have not kind of strictly enforced these rules. and We have uh, uh, asked them to, I mean, we have uh, make, it, make it so flexible so that the end users can, the health facilities can decide uh, which is the best option for them. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for that. The questions are coming in quite quickly now. It seems like people are really intrigued by your presentation. Uh, just two more questions for you before we need to take a break and, and move on. Um, we have one question. Um, I'll just go ahead and ask both of them now. Um, we have one question is, how long did it take to implement these various data quality checks? And then the other question is, what happens if sus suspicious data is found? Uh, in the review process, how do you go back and make the change and how do you keep track of the changes that you've made? Yeah, so uh, I will take the MCH uh, instance for this example, I mean, the, the two questions asked. So uh, like the MCH instance was initially set up in year 2017 and now we have uh, passed three years of implementations. So uh, data quality, ensuring data quality was not the number one priority uh, during 2017. So it was in 2017, it was mainly about uh, uh, addressing user issues in accessing the system, entering data, and to ensure the completeness, like even those are uh, data quality measures, but like we didn't go into this finer uh, data related issues in the first year. But then from year 2018, 2019, these years we focus mostly on the data call. I mean, like things, uh, especially we, we put a lot of emphasis on uh, during the reviews because these reviews used to be uh, happening based on the paper data uh, that was, I mean, previously before 2017. So then there was some transformation required uh, 
uh, from 2018 onwards to use the system for this review meeting. So it took some time into that. Uh, so it was like, uh, so what, I'm, what I would like to say is like, if you see how it's, uh, our, our plans for future, so we have uh, more plans like uh, compared to what we have done so far. So it's a work in progress. So we, we have achieved uh, some level as of now, but we have a lot to do. So we can't say like we have uh, ensured data quality in these last three years. We have done, uh, we have taken some major steps, but uh, there's a lot more to do. So it's uh, really about like what you try to achieve. And uh, sorry, what was the second question? Uh, what happens if you do find suspicious data in the review? How are, How is it changed and how do you keep track of the changes? Yeah, the thing is like uh, now that of course, like what happens is like they try to understand what is the issue with this data during this review. So. For example, uh, now I mentioned about these desk reviews that, the, uh, that, that our staff is conducting at national level. So during the desk reviews, if they identify some, uh, some, some data quality issues before the reviews, they will contact the health facility and advise them. And uh, if, uh, if for some reason, if uh, the same mistake is happening over and over again, they really try to talk to the health manager or the public health doctor and identify why it is happening and try to like, if they identify the issue that, that this may be happening, Recurrently, so then uh, there may be some training gaps, which uh, we, if we identify, we in fact uh, even like what we try to do is if we feel that in a particular district that uh, there is the same mistake that is happening over and over again, we try to uh, uh, organize a refresher uh, data analysis training uh, where we also uh, talk about data quality uh, during that process. And then the other thing is sometimes like I mean uh, to ensure the timeliness, we 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 lock. The data after a particular given period of time. So then we have to put uh, what we do is we will put lock exceptions and uh, after accepting that it's a mistake and uh, when uh, they have uh, like the end user, I mean at the facility level, they, they accept that it's a mistake which has been communicated to national level, then only we will put uh, lock exceptions and unlock the data for it to be correct. So those kind of measures are what we do when we find out there are some data quality issues. Okay, that's that's very clear. And again, thank you so much, Pamud, for the wonderful presentation. There were many, uh, quite a few questions that I don't think we have time to get to. We